either representations of human beings or images of artifacts and such as stars and, or things that were related to human beings. And he said prior to that, prior to these sort of modern mandalas, you get in the great uh, mandalic visions of the world, there's always a sort of god at the center. And he said, now the new interest appears to be at the center of the mandala, the interest in the human being in and for himself as a unique phenomenon, and that this really is the Western Northern European contribution to the history of the evolution of consciousness is now the shifting from, I mean, the past, we're shifting into the sign of Aquarius now, where the figure is a human pouring water from the, the jug, and the past signs have all been animal figures. And uh, so now we do seem to be shifting from, on the one hand, a kind of uh, theriomorphic animal interest in the divine, which marks the Paleolithic obsession with finding the god in the animal, to now an interest in the development of the human being and the uniquenesses and the interest in the human being. And so Campbell says these mandalas no longer have anything to say to us. They have to do with the traditions of the past and we're moving into a world of totally new horizons and it is precisely the result of the West's uh, scientific tradition that has brought us to this threshold. And so now each of us is creating his or her own mythology and it is up to each one of us uh, to work it out on our own as it were. So there are these new creativities but there are also new dangers. I mean, nature uh, loves nothing more than an experiment, and uh, individuals go awry uh, probably more colorfully than in the West than they do uh, anywhere else. And that is the sort of shadow side of this uh, experiment that the spirit seems to be undertaking uh, with the human race uh, through Northern European and the American civilization. So uh, that's about as far as I wanted to take us for tonight. So uh, perhaps now we can move into discussion if anybody wants to focus on. Yes. Uh, I think it's really interesting that you brought up that uh, thing of art and perspective because if you look in these old buildings in Europe and everything, there was no organization whatsoever. Yes. All of the art was really flat. There was no dimension. There was no anything. Then all of a sudden, boom, it just kind of hits on the scene. And then all of a sudden, there's organization. <laughs> it's like, sure. things to bury people like all over. I mean, there was no way to reason. A perspectival. Yeah. Yes. It was just amazing. Yes, there's no sense of space at all in the, the Byzantine paintings. And, um, the figures are painted, you know, Christ is this divine gargantuan trembling or, or trampling all over these tiny little villages. And there's no regard for perspective at all. The perspective is uh, on the God and on the spiritual dimension as being the most, uh, you know, the most fascinating aspect that uh, uh, the earth archetype, yeah, doesn't come in until 15th century. Maybe. Yes, I particularly like Young and Rob Hand's correlation with the, uh, the procession of the equinoxes from the vertical fish to the horizontal fish. That's a lot of fun. Where, where was that written? Uh, that's in uh, his uh, Hand's Essays on Astrology. Oh, okay. And then Young discusses, he picks it up from Young, who discusses it in Eon, uh, the phenomenology of the self. On that image of the fishes? Yes. You have to look. Like yeah. And what you're saying is it's going like. You have to this. look at them. Uh, I'm not a big. Uh, my knowledge of astronomy is very inadequate, but you have to look at them as they're pictured, not stylized, but as they're supposed to lay out in the constellations. And one is vertical, connected with a kind of umbilical cord to a horizontal one. You have to find the right image. I've seen it, but. Uh, oh, that's okay. oh, you do. Oh, okay. Yeah. I'm not even getting that. They're represented stylized as always in a like a kind of yin yang. Get back at the Madalas. That are they using it more for like a meditation use now? I came across um, the internet a couple of weeks ago. There was like a, a picture of a uh, Mandala on there, and um, well, it looked like one to me anyway. And it was used for um, meditation, meditation work. Yes. And Yeah, I think they probably picked that up from the yantras of the Hindus, where they were designed as meditations. But ultimately, to uh, the whole point of the Hindu mandalas actually is, is uh, not to stop with the mandala, but to uh, disengage the mind from imagery altogether, to sort of catapult the soul out into the, the void, Brahman, where you experience uh, no subject-object distinction whatsoever, but it's 
unification. So the Hindu images are always uh, uh, conceived as a kind of bow to shoot the soul out into Brahman and to transcend the use of imagery altogether. But that's probably where it's come from, is that, that yantra idea. But it's interesting, if you, if you work with drawing mandalas, um, it really activates the dream cycle. Yeah, yeah, I've, I've played around with them too, and they, they definitely have a hypnotic effect on the psyche. And uh, particularly Young would say that um, a lot of his patients, when they were upset, uh, would find themselves calmed down just by drawing them. I mean, it does tend to harmonize the psyche. Didn't monkeys to walk those mandalas? Oh, sure, yeah. They've, they've done everything with a mandala you can do. Just walk, yeah. Yeah, it was from the cycle. It's like the label. we should uh, draw the line here. And uh, for next time, uh, we'll start moving into uh, Stanislav Graf now. And uh, so the next book is in uh, The Adventure of Self-Discovery. And uh, I don't actually have the book in front of me, uh, but just start reading it and get as far into it as you can. Uh, it's all good stuff. And uh, we'll play around with that. Thank <laughs> you.